All right, everyone. Hello, my name is Jennifer West. I'm the Artistic Director of Muse West Concerts. We are live on Facebook with the fantastic Icarus Quartet. And we just introduced them, but I'll get them to introduce themselves again for our podcast recording. We're going to start with Yevgeny. What instrument do you play? Um, I'm one of the pianists in the quartet. Um, I'm currently in Ohio, teaching at Bowling Green State University, uh, and currently at home. Fantastic. And we'll stay in the piano section. Next, we have Larry. Uh, Larry, how did you meet these guys? Uh, well, this is all Yale connections. So, you know, it's kind of all in the family, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, and I'm uh, coming to you live from Boston. So I, I escaped New York for a little bit. And uh, Larry's cat might join us later. We're not yeah. sure. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> and we have two cats now. Yeah, two cats. You have two cats now? Well, no, it's my parents' cat, and they don't like each other. So but we'll see. So Daisy and your parents' cat are not friends? No, no, uh, they're not copacetic. So. Uh-oh, no good. No, no, no bueno. <laughs> no bueno. <laughs> and moving to the percussion section, we have Matt. Matt, you are near Baltimore, and you're moving soon. Yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm one of the percussionists. And yeah, I've lived in the Baltimore area for a couple of years now. And I'm just moving to a different, a different place in the same area. So that's where I'm joining you from today. Matt, thanks for having us, Jen. It's my pleasure. Um, Matt and Jeff. Jeff, you're the other percussionist. Uh, where are you based? I'm also in Baltimore and been here for about six years now. Not, not consecutively, but enough to uh, really feel home here. So. And um, so Matt and Jeff, you teach at Peabody, correct? In the percussion department? Yeah, yep. so we're both there. Jeff does, uh, does a lot more there than me. I'm kind of like a, a small part there. So I'll let, let him kind of say what he, what he does. Yeah, we have uh, a program at, at Peabody that's been a really strong kind of breeding ground for percussionists for many years now. Both Matt and I went there as students and we, stayed with the same professor. The professor that actually brought us together as a group is Robert Van Sice. He's kind of this godfather figure in the field of percussion and contemporary music and chamber music. So he teaches at Peabody along with Curtis and Yale. And so we came to study with him from just knowing him and his reputation and, and the reputation of, of his students to work with him in Baltimore. And then both of us went up to New Haven to work with him at Yale as well, where they have the Yale Percussion Group, which uh, is a smaller class of only six people. And that kind of stays constant uh, as people rotate in and out of the studio. But the group itself, the Yale Percussion Group, has gained some recognition as being of you know, professional caliber and gaining the, uh, a reputable kind of um, a reputable image from composers and have premiered and commissioned pieces as a group. And since then has, has kind of transformed into what uh, Mr. Van Sice has taken on into a professional project, even though the Yale percussion group is still there and still playing at a great level. But when we were there, he had us together for this, what was at the time a pretty new piece by Paul Lansky to play the piece textures uh, because the Yale percussion group had been asked to represent the School of Music for the Yale New York series, which happens every year when they bring uh, some chamber project or something that the, the dean is interested in down to uh, Yale, or sorry, down to New York to play at Carnegie Hall. What an experience. I miss New York a lot. <laughs> Larry, do you miss New York? <laughs> uh, honestly, not really. <laughs> Because this is not, it's, it's, a, it's a pale reminder of what New York used to be. Mm -hmm. So it, you go outside and it's, it's kind of strange. Everything's shut down. You know, uh, I haven't been on the subway in four months, which has been great. That's actually a, you know, a huge bonus. Huge that's, bonus. That's a blessing. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how much it turns your life around. Um, yes. <laughs> but, but with everything closed and people kind of uh, on edge, it's a, it's a strange vibe. So it's actually kind of nice to get out and you know, clear my head. For a little bit. I had the same experience. Um, Vancouver was on a pretty serious, uh, not as serious of a lockdown as New York or Italy or Seattle. Um, but yeah, people in Vancouver were definitely wearing masks and there were long lineups for grocery stores. 
Um, and then my friend and I took a road trip to the Okanagan to British Columbia's wine country where everything was open for regular hours. Very few people wore masks and it was a very bizarre experience. And then two weeks later, we found out that there were outbreaks in that exact location. And I thought to myself, well, that's why. <laughs> um, but yeah, it has been strange. And I'm sure Baltimore has become quieter too. Yeah, thankfully the, the state has handled it fairly well in, in comparison to maybe others. And our, mm. I think our governor has done a pretty good job. But just like we're seeing now, I think uh, as, as things have reopened, we're starting to see a surge even here. And I know our, our fearless president has mentioned us in the, in the press lately in the media as, as being one of, I think, 11 cities that is going to need some, some serious help. So mm -hmm. it doesn't feel that dire from my position, but um, yeah, things are, are definitely being handled carefully. I think that's the key. Um, but let's, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about more pleasant things. We can talk about pandemic impact on music a bit later. Um, I think we're all missing ensemble performances right now so deeply. Um, I know that I'm doing Kodai training right now, which involves virtual choir. And it is just not the same as the person next to you singing a resonant line that goes perfectly with the line you're singing. It's just not the same. Um, no substitute allowed. <laughs> um, but my first question, kind of a fun question, you're all in different places. Um, so you kind of have this, and I, Larry has called it this before, it's a long distance chamber music relationship. <laughs> um, and it's, you're in different states, um, I think Ohio is the longest drive from each of you. Um, and um, I guess you're meeting in a few days. How do you manage to um, communicate and make music and make musical plans, either even during this pandemic or before? How did you manage being in different geographical areas? Because it's important for an ensemble to rehearse regularly. Yeah, so we, we've yeah, this is something that, that we, we like, this comparison of, of a long distance uh, relationship, uh, because there are some parallels. Um, I think, well, I've been in a long distance relationship. Matt was in a long distance uh, engagement. Uh, oh, I guess first year of marriage too, right? Yeah, we did every, we dated, engaged, marriage, all yeah, long yeah. distance. Yeah, I think we've all been in a long distance relationship. So we know what it feels like. Um, and yeah, there are a few parallels. One, one of them that, that we like to talk about is that you really try to make the best out of um, the time when, that you do spend together. And so that, that's something that's important to us, that when we do meet, we actually try to you know, rehearse very intensely um, and play concerts. So you know, if, if we were living in one city, for instance, we would have the luxury of you know, a concert here, a concert there. Uh, because we're living in different places, we try to group these performances together and, and also group these rehearsals together. So it's not a weekly rehearsal on Wednesdays from four to six. Uh, it's more of let's meet next week and rehearse for six days for whatever, nine hours a day. Uh, well, we'll talk about the nine hours or six hours, but um, yeah, so that's just one thing that um, was definitely happening before the pandemic hit and is well going to happen now with the pandemic as well. Um, I'm going to throw this question to Larry. What are your rehearsals like when you guys meet? Well, I mean, Evgeny kind of uh, lucid, you know, kind of hinted at it. They're they're long and they're involved. Um, but it's that's one of the real nice things about about how we work is that uh, it, 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 having those restraints and those constraints and how you're able to spend time and how you're able to rehearse really focuses. You. Right, you don't really have too much leeway one way or the other to waste time on, on useless stuff. So when we go into a session, it's like, well, you get it done. That's that's <laughs> is the general uh, you know goal. It's always just get it done, right? Uh, leave your ego at the door. Try to do as much work as we can, and try to try to you know end up with the best product that we can given those constraints. And it's it's actually I think in a way uh, a good recipe for productivity. Because you're you're not allowed. You know, there is no uh, <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, we'll just add an hour or add or add it two hours or whatever. And come back next week. You know, we we have to finish things off. So yeah, it's intense. 
I feel like one thing that we learned a long time ago too from our teacher was that uh, was to not skip steps in the process. So it, we actually save time by going through this really rigorous process. And it's, I think that if a lot of people watch musicians practice and if you watch us rehearse, it's kind of funny at times how slowly we go or how little amount of music we actually take. But really we're just trying to get it right from the beginning because it would be really easy for a group like ours to skim over things. I mean, like, oh, we, we don't have many days or we don't have much time, let's keep going through it. But we, we get to a, down to a pretty detailed process pretty early on because uh, I think that it actually does save time in the end. It's a slower process at first, but it's longer lasting and, and saves us time. And, um, you know, I've, I've seen one of your quartet members teach and I can imagine the detail, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is just fantastic. Uh, Jeff, who picks the music in your quartet? Is it kind of a group decision? Do the percussionists kind of know where to look for this repertoire? How does it go? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I I think through playing together, we've started to naturally kind of pick on, uh, pick up each other's aesthetical interests, and and we know that each of us plays music outside the group that has a wider uh, range of of uh, obviously dates of of periods of time that the music comes from, but also aesthetics, and we've kind of fell into where we kind of sit now quite naturally by all falling in love in love with that first. Piece I mentioned, uh, Paul Lansky's textures. And when we decided to keep playing as a group and not just be a one-time school project, we were both, we were all interested in, in picking up, I think the next two pieces we went to were the Bartok and the Reich. So you kind of have the two complete ends of the spectrum that's even available to us as an ensemble. And so, so in that way, we, we got to know kind of, we got to feed into a little bit of the end of the pianist classical realm, or, you know, I know that's well beyond that, that period, but as far as pianistic music that focuses on the things that they've been studying and, and showcasing their true abilities and what these guys can do is amazing. Um, and then kind of through building that, we, we commissioned our friend, uh, Michael Lorello. And so I, those are the two tracks, I think finding people that we, we just generally, genuinely like as people, and and the music obviously comes along with that. Um, and then the pieces that we found to complement that that aren't specifically com commissioned for us uh, come from different places. But I think automatically from throwing a, a few options out there that other members have knocked down or or not been so into, we found this kind of meeting ground of of really fun music that is satisfying in a way that grooves and is aesthetically kind of uh, approachable from the beginning. And I think the pianists, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they use their uh, romantic and, and, and classical kind of expression in their other uh, medium outlets. And when they come to Icarus, it's more of a time to embrace the percussiveness that me and Matt bring to it and focus on kind of, you know, rocking out and, and, and playing loud and full and um, enjoying the, the complexity that comes along with uh, the layering and the, and the voicing and the execution of these really dense um, and, and fun kind of rhythmic aspects. I know that Larry's mentioned to me that what he does enjoy about rehearsing with Icarus um, is not only like the people, but um, he's like, you haven't seen rhythms like this. <laughs> and that it's, it's a really fun challenge for the brain and, and the coordination. Um, this leads actually really well to a question I had put later in what I wanted to ask you, but this leads perfectly into your IQ tests because Bach didn't write for your ensemble. Well, you can arrange Bach's music um, for your ensemble, but he didn't write anything original. So you have to get original music. So. Um, who would like to talk about the IQ tests and your commissioning, which I think are fantastic projects? Um, I mean, I, I can, yeah, I'll just, I'll just go, I guess. Um, so IQ tests is, 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 is a new project for us. It's a new initiative. Uh, it actually uh, was born as a, as a result of, of this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we realized that many 
schools, many universities, um, a lot of activities just being canceled. Uh, and so for many composer students, all their opportunities are being taken away. Because uh, when you're in school, yes, you, you, you do have some professional activity, but also a lot of what you do is within your university. Uh, so this was a way for us, um, I mean, it's, it's great for us because we, we get to work with talented composers, but the, the goal here was also to help these uh, young student composers, to help them out, uh, to give them an opportunity to further their career, to give them a chance to work with a professional ensemble, uh, to write something and, and really experience true collaboration. Because this is not just us, you know, commissioning a piece, and then writing and then bye-bye. Uh, this is really a collaborative uh, process um, where we're, we actually just received some first pieces and drafts and we're, we're gonna rehearse some of that and we're gonna send some comments back and start a dialogue and, and, and all of that. So that's, that's, that's at least what the purpose of IQ tests is. Is it about relationship building with composers? Like it's not going to be a one-time composition and it's going to be like maybe building a suite of pieces or future collaboration? I'm not so much sure about the, the suite, but there, we definitely wouldn't rule out any future collaborations with the same composers. One thing that we've talked about already from seeing the success of how this process has evolved, we'd like to continue it as, a, as an annual initiative. Um, and keep bringing people into our family in that way. And I know that, uh, as an example, Matt and I attended the A Blackbird Lab, which uh, only had two years uh, of existence. I, they're, they're working on bringing it back. But from that, it's just been really touching to see their lasting investment in the, the fellows of that program and how they continually try to mentor and support uh, in, in a variety of ways, the, the growth of the people that came there to work with them. And I think we would love to use these IQ tests in a similar way to elevate the uh, exposure and uh, quality and just and build continued relationships in, in any fashion, really, with, with the composers. And, and I think that for the amount of music that we take on, because we get really detailed, we end up kind of zooming in and focusing in every piece and every person that we work with becomes occupies kind of a, a large space in our our lives at that moment uh, you know when we're working on Steve Reich we're thinking a lot about Steve Reich it's not a, a one-off gig piece that oh we happen to play a quartet so we have these two young composers now Stephen Downing and Yang Wang that won the competition and right now I'm, I mean they're they're part of our, our daily existence in terms of what we're thinking towards. And, and that's not something I think that everyone can say when they, when they pick up pieces of music or when they look to start new collaborations. So we're looking forward and to that. The other thing is when, when we really had no idea what this was going to look like when we started the initiative, we didn't know who was going to apply or how many applications we would get or the level. And I know we were all really pleasantly surprised that the pieces we saw were amazing. And these two composers that, that ended up winning are, I mean, they're going to have amazing careers without a doubt. And so we're really excited to be kind of getting in at the ground level with them as they're finishing up grad school. And I'm sure that these projects will go, will go on to other places and that we'll collaborate with them again in the future in a more professional relationship in some way, because I, I really, I, I believe strongly in, in what they are and I'm really impressed with the, the people that came out for it. And that's, I, I, I hope a lot of my students will listen to this podcast or this live call because, um, and I, I know this from having watched Larry teach, um, is slowing things down and not taking on so much rep that is too hard for you in the amount of time that you have to prepare. I think this is, as musicians, we can all agree this is like one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of musicians make is taking on too big of a program without the time to live and breathe with the pieces and to skim over things. And um, from your fantastic video recordings um, that different members of your court have shared with me, I. I just feel like that's one thing that a lot of young musicians could look up to Icarus Quartet um, for is this process of 
living with the music in detail and not skimming over things um, and being accountable to each other for rhythmic precision, artistic integrity, and choosing repertoire that um, will voice that. Um, so my next question is about the name of your group because Icarus didn't end up so well in mythology. <laughs> So who wants to recap the story of Icarus and why, why Icarus Quartet? <laughs> How did that name come up? So Icarus was one of many names that was on a very long list that we uh, suffered through together in a kind of four on, uh, as each of the four of us kind of battled for our favorites and, and uh, felt strongly about certain ones that we had to cross that off. That was the one that eventually made it through and you know we love the sound of it and I think that there are plenty of just really nice and, and somewhat beautiful poetic translations to what we do so to answer your first question about about the the myth and the story of Icarus Icarus was the son of Daedalus who was a an architect and an inventor that was uh, brought on by um, the, the King Minos of Crete to build the, the labyrinth for the Minotaur to house him. And they would take some of these people from Athens and send them in to die every so often uh, people that were chosen at random from society. And um, eventually he helped, uh, uh, Daedalus helped uh, Theseus by giving him a string to, uh, track his movement into the labyrinth and slay the minotaur and come out. And for that, the king punished Daedalus for, for helping him and imprisoned him in this tower. And he was there with his son and they were looking for ways to escape. And, and Daedalus being this prolific inventor uh, found that he could string together feathers to makeshift wings. And so they were both planning to escape together with these, this, with these wings made of string and, and uh, fortified by wax. And he warned his, his son, Icarus, to be careful not to fly too high because if you get too close to the sun, the, max, the wax will melt. And also not to fly too low because uh, the water can spray up from the ocean and, and make the wings too heavy and you'll fall in that way. So... Obviously, as the myth goes, he flies too close to the sun, and as he's flapping his arms, he realizes that he's got nothing left attached to his arms and falls down. So we've kind of equated that to ourselves as a quartet, kind of rewriting that story of still aspiring for these, these heights of artistry and that kind of uh, that metaphor of shooting for, for the sun and going as high as possible with the ideals of, of the kind of art that we're making and, and the level that we're doing it at. Um, but I think also there's something really beautiful about that, that message to not go too low and to kind of have this, this path that, um, that straddles those, those two uh, extremes, because like we were talking about with the, the choices of repertoire, I think that it's really important to us, and we've talked about this numerous times as a group, to make sure that we're finding music that has those similar ideals of aspiring to these heights, but is also uh, down enough, down to earth enough that it is uh, accessible to a, a non a musician, the layman, and, and something that everyone can access and have fun with. And, and maybe if there's deeper meaning behind it or under it, as you go into the structure and, and all of the details of its composition, you can find those gems underneath. But we like playing this music that, um, that brings in all kinds of people and is inspired by mainstream and, and indie music and all those kinds of things. That's a wonderful answer. And I think that, um, you know, in another world, um, I'll be able to invite you to play live in Vancouver <laughs> and we'll have a really beautiful, hip, cool space where you can set up percussion and um, we'll get our season sponsors. Shout out to Tom Lee Music who sponsored this microphone as well. Um, <laughs> I promised <laughs> um, that, you know, they can bring us two pianos and you guys can have percussion and we'll do this in a really cool venue. And uh, once there's a vaccine and everything is 
uh, healed again. And I think that I think it would draw a crowd of people who wouldn't necessarily sit through the last three Beethoven piano sonatas, um, even though that's a pretty cool program itself, but only for people as nerdy as me and the top row here of Larry and Genya. <laughs> um, so my next question actually relates to, and I'll throw this one to Larry. Um, you have a lot of experience as a soloist um, and have had like a lot of success in solo piano, um, including recently New York Concert Artists. Bravo. Thank you. Um, for those of the people listening on audio, we all just clapped for Larry. <laughs> um, and how is this experience different than going on stage and playing Miroir plus a Mozart sonata or preparing for a solo recital? And what has this brought to your life musically? Because this is really different than your regular quote unquote day job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I first uh, when I first started with the group, people were like, "This is uh, this is new. <laughs> this is outside your ken." Yeah, and uh, for for most people who, who who have known me over the years, like I am relatively conservative in my musical taste, and um, and those are the kind of things that I was most comfortable with, and I thrived in. But, you know, uh, as with all things in life, being too comfortable is never a good thing. So when, uh, in a way, being exposed to repertoire that I was not at first even feeling capable of playing, and then through that struggle of, of getting to know it and then get, getting to master it, it, um, it forces you to grow, right? It forces you, first of all, you, uh, it gives you a conception of, of rhythm and, and how absolutely tight it can be. Because, you know, pianists, we spend a lot of time alone and we spend a lot of time playing alone. And as you know, the, the human being's capability of dealing with the fourth dimension, usually not so good. So, and you know, when you're on, you're on stage by yourself, you can, it's all over the place. Most pianists, be, it's all over the place, right? And, um, and even when you play with string players, right? It's still, there is this, there's a certain laxity that you have in terms of attack, in terms of how you mesh the sounds, right? There is more leeway. We, we don't have so much leeway, right? The attack is the attack, and you have really that nanosecond, that microsecond to make it work. So there's not that leeway, and so you learn real quick that you kind of have to breathe together. You kind of have to hear it together. It's not necessarily just about playing it together. You have to breathe it together. You have to have a similar conception, right? And so it, it, it forces you to be even more specific in how you approach things and not just the musical stuff, but in the communication aspect of it as well, right? And I always tell this to my own students, which is that when you're playing solo, you should never think of it as solo, right? It, it is, you're, 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 on, you're, you're out there alone, but you're not, you're in charge of, if you want to call it a chamber ensemble, a chamber ensemble, an orchestra, an orchestra, right? It is many forces, that's the you know, wonders of the piano that we can, we can emulate orchestra, we can emulate a trio, we can em emulate, uh, <clears throat> you know, a chorale, whatever, whatever it is, right? But when you're thinking about it, the conception still is primarily a cooperative conception of music. And so through, through my work with these guys, it's, it really, it heightens that. And it will, it always transfers over in ways that you don't ever, plan for it to or do you really uh think that it will but the that kind of interconnectedness between the things that we do as musicians it's uh it's quite mysterious that's a wonderful answer and i think that applying what you're playing to solo repertoire is really important um my next question is uh for matt as a group how have you been able to stay connected through the pandemic i'm sure you've had Zoom group meetings and group chats. Um, how have you stayed connected musically? Have you shared recordings with each other, shared possible scores? Yeah, so I mean, specifically, or I, I, we have been meeting every week. And so more than musically being connected, we're actually connected uh, more tightly logistically right now than we ever have been. So we, we, we would meet fairly regularly before. But now we have every Thursday at noon, we have an hour and a half meeting and we talk over everything from um, whether it's 
how we're going to feel a new piece of music. Recently, we've been talking about groupings and nerdy things like that of, oh, are you going to feel it in 4-4? Four, four? Are you going to feel it in 5-8 here? And so with everything from that to, okay, what time are we, you know, what time are we taking our lunch break on Tuesday's uh, afternoon rehearsal? You know, <laughs> all the way down to, to those details. Uh, we we kind of cover it all. So we stay connected in... Uh, every way possible through these through these weekly meetings right now and it's it's been great for us we're taking we've been taking large strides as an ensemble in new ways and so i don't I, without letting the, the cat out of the bag we have some some new things that we're looking forward to introducing soon with with merchandise and some logos and all of this fun stuff um, so we've been finding ways to progress as a group uh, even without without being together well, this sounds like a perfect time to ask where our audience can follow you on social media and websites to find out about your merch. Merch, that is so cool. <laughs> where can they find you? So we're on Instagram and Facebook as Icarus Quartet. And then uh, you can find our website at IcarusQuartet.org. And uh, that's where the merchandise will be going up. I don't know, Jeff, do we have a, a plan or any sort of date of when that's actually coming out now? You can keep your eyes on it this week. Ooh, yeah. exciting times. <laughs> We're excited, yeah. Please offer free shipping to Canada. <laughs> oh, let me tell you that the struggle of ordering things with US currency and then the fear of when the FedEx guy arrives, what are the duty taxes going to be? It's scary. Um, it's wonderful to hear how you've been connected with weekly lunch meetings on Thursdays. Um, I think that that's so important. And I know there's people that I didn't think I could possibly get closer to, but during the pandemic I have just because there's been times and they're in different time zones than me. There's been times for us to actually meet without the stress of travel or commuting or um, rehearsals or all sorts of other things or going to concerts. It, it's been a bit of a mixed bag, mixed blessing. Um, but of course, we would love to hear you live in Vancouver once it's safe, um, once the border opens, um, waiting for a vaccination. It's, it'll be a while that we can hold on tight. <laughs> um, so my next question is, um, our organization is really focused on education. Um, we're focused on master classes and um, community engagement where we go to schools. How is Icarus Quartet engaging with music education? Um, well, first of all, we all teach. Um, um, both in university level and, and environments um, or, and or privately. Uh, so we are active, each, each one individually uh, in that manner. In addition to that, uh, as a group, uh, we visit universities often. That, that's a big part of our, of our professional activity. And when we go to university to perform, um, we always offer, and it, it almost always includes some kind of workshop and or masterclass uh, where we engage with students. Um, either, like I said, masterclasses, which would focus on their instrument but also workshops to composers how to write for our instrumentation uh, you might read works by these uh student composers um stuff like that so yeah we're, we're very much um engaged with universities um we also had a chance to uh visit schools as in you know k k through 12 uh but so so far most of our activities is academic level I, I was going to touch actually on the, the, the K through 12 thing that you mentioned at the end is yes. well, I think we all have different ideas uh, that we're excited about with education within the group. And one of the things that we've talked about for a long time that's finally coming to fruition this year is that we're about to have a one piano program. So all four members of the group, but one single piano, because there are a lot of places that are closed off to us. That's why we do so much at universities is because if there's one place that's going to have two pianos, it's going to be a university. Mm -hmm. And so now we have a whole hour of music that will be premiering this March, I believe. So it's late, later this year, that's uh, all for a single piano. And what that does is it allows us to now 
not only play concerts everywhere, but also do educational events anywhere that we want. That you, even a local elementary school is going to have one single piano mm -hmm. because when we do educational events, it's not just, or at least for me, like I don't want it to just be talking to college students and training the next level of, of professional musician, but I wanna be sharing some of these ideas with younger students and being able to play for them is a big part of that, especially when you're talking to non-musicians or young kids. So the fact that we're going to have a program that we can travel to any school now and play and be able to talk about music, I think is going to be huge for opening up what we can do as far as educational events are concerned. Well, and as a, as a music teacher, I've completed ORF level one and two training and the marimba is like pretty close to our ORF instruments. <laughs> much larger scale and you play much more professionally than my my students would but for them to see a marimba or to see a non-pitched percussion instrument that they use for their ostinato or their drone in music class in combination with piano would be really cool and even more common is young elementary school students who take piano lessons and like larry said spend a lot of time alone practicing and they don't know that even as a pianist you can have friends. <laughs> um, yes, even pianists can have friends. <laughs> I'm allowed to say that I'm a pianist. But um, so uh, last more serious question, then we have some really fun zingers to end the call with. You talked about not having two pianos as a logistical sort of uh, challenge. Any other logistical challenges other than the sheer amount of space and time it takes to unload and uh, reload the percussion instruments from the van or truck? Anything that our audience can't imagine might be a logistical challenge? Yes. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I'll just start by saying I've wanted to have a mixed instrumentation chamber group for, you know, as long as I can remember now in terms of my formal training. I just loved trying to make percussion sound like something else or, or be inspired by different ways of making music. Um, piano is arguably the closest in terms of mechanism and type of sound that you could get. Um, and maybe in my mind, it was more geared towards playing with wind, wind and or string players and things like that. But this uh, ended up being perfect, except the, the logistic uh, component. And I always thought when I was dreaming up these kind of ensembles that I, I might be in one day that my setup would be the burden of the logistical you know concerns and uh it wasn't until icarus that i discovered that it could be worse um <laughs> which is having to worry about you know being limited in venues to have the two pianos or worrying about the piano rentals and the dual tunings and all that kind of stuff and i guess aside from the time that it takes to do all those things and set up and load and get the gear that you already mentioned uh, we're starting to in some ways kind of inflict more pain on ourselves by adding uh, tech components to that. Um, even with the single piano program, we are going to be uh, including some multimedia elements and some of the pieces will be played piano four hands and while others are going to be uh, piano plus toy piano and piano plus synthesizer that's, you know, triggered by, by logic and has uh, some, you know, delay effects or, or things like that. And we're, you know, Larry's already gotten used to uh, playing with synth and controlling his uh, his piano, his grand piano pedals with his page turning pedal with his sustain pedal on the keyboard and and the nightmare that is that me and Matt have absolutely zero sympathy for. And um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're starting to bring those more into the mix and um, I'll also say that the IQ test pieces are going to be featured on this program and and uh, one of them has already expressed interest in pulling in some really interesting sounds through the use of, of synthesizers and, and uh, interesting kinds of, of patches and things like that that we're really excited about what those possibilities could be. But that's kind of our next frontier, um, along with some possible visual elements. Um, it's been a, a dream to have uh, the, the pianist highlighted through, through video projection. Um, mm -hmm. Me and Matt are, are tall people that take up a lot of space and our, our movements are exaggerated uh, and percussion has an inherent choreography to it. 
um, you know, and when you go to a piano concert, it's like, who's going to get the, the keyboard side seat? You know, it's always a big thing. And even the keyboard side seat, yes, it's better, but it's still hard to see what's going on. And so to match the physicality and the visual space, uh, you know, we try to be as coherent as a quartet as possible in terms of our, um, our oral presentation uh, and balance is, is, is tricky. But um, in terms of the visual component, we would love to highlight the, the kind of miniature dance that's happening on the keyboard as well as kind of our more broad strokes that, that we're painting up front. So from a presenter's point of view, we got to save our money. <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping to make it as painless as possible. We're figure, <laughs> figuring out ways. It's, these, these are the dreams, and then we figure out how to make them happen realistically. No, this is this. I mean, that makes a lot of sense because it would be hard to see the piano's hands. And I just want to make sure you guys are going to make Larry play the toy piano, right? I think he is. Can I? Do you remember Larry? I have before. So uh, uh, we, we've been we've been doing having these deals between you, Danny, and I, and uh, yeah, we. You know, we, we, we kind of balance it out. So, so one of us is taking the part that has more experimental techniques, like uh, for Thomas's piece, uh, uh, Evgeny has his well-worn, uh, what is that? It's not a credit card. What kind of card was it? It's a- It's a gift card. Oh, uh, right. It's from, from Naples. Naples. Yes, which no longer exists, unfortunately, RIP, you know. But the card lived on. The card lived on, right, right. So, but yes, uh, yeah, I might, I, I will be taking the synth for sure. Uh, and, and perhaps a toy piano as well, so. Sounds fun. We have come to the rapid fire round. Uh, be prepared for some zingers. Um, you may have some things to talk about in your Thursday meeting when the truth comes out. <laughs> the first question is, um, who from your group is most likely to miss their flight? Well, Jeff. We any <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Definitely like earlier to meet before Larry and Jeff. Don't, don't. <laughs> fair, fair enough. enough. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were going to say Larry or me. So you just right, it's fair enough. enough. Right, it's fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we, we know about that situation now. Um, who <laughs> is the most likely to forget their dress shoes or some element of what they're supposed to wear on stage? Not this guy. <laughs> yeah, 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 probably, probably. I think that's me. Yeah, that I've definitely, I, I've forgotten belts and all sorts of things before. I'm, a, I'm spacey with that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and who's most likely to want to drive for the majority of the road trip? Maybe me. I don't know. Yeah. Everyone I mean, except Larry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, Vinny just got uh got his license not too long ago, so he's still he's still trying to log his hours, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Work on those backup cam techniques. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nine and three. <laughs> um, and our last fun question is: Who's the most likely to be picky or want to choose the restaurant when you're on tour? Larry. Larry. Definitely. <laughs> he's our foodie. Yes. All right, fine, fair, <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough. Oh, that's wonderful. And our last question uh, for each of you, we'll start with, uh, with Evgeny, two favorite desert island recordings that you would have to bring with you. Man, that's difficult. Um, so I've actually recently started this new thing with my wife that before going to sleep in bed, we listen to about 10 to 15 minutes of music. So this, and she's not a classical musician, so this would be an excuse for me to go through some of my old recordings, so I have a lot on my mind right now. So I guess I'll just mention two recordings from yesterday and the day before. Uh, so the Fischl Disco and Horowitz recording of Dieterlieb from Carnegie, and whatever, yeah, that, I mean, Horowitz there. I, all my love to, to, to Fischl Disco, but Horowitz there is just unbelievable. Um, and the Michelangelo CD of Rafano's fourth piano concerto and Ravel's concerto in G. Wow, stunning choices. Some pretty serious choices too. Um, He's wonderful. a very serious guy, serious, serious guy. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and Larry, what are two recordings that you would have to have with you? Uh, 
it, it changes every day. But uh, right now, I think off the top of my head, it would have to be the album Baird Quartet recording with Heinrich Schiff of the Schubert Cello Quintet, which is the best recording of that piece ever. Uh, rest in peace, Schiff. You know, wonderful cello. Oh, such a beautiful cello. And the other one would probably be Abbey Road. Yeah, I'm 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 on I'm on another Beatles kick recently. So phenomenal. It's one. It's it, for me one of their own, only albums that really is conceived from beginning to end as an album. Like it, you, you have to listen to the entire thing. It's wonderful. Sergeant Pepper, man. Okay, all right. I mean, oh, all right, <laughs> we, we, we can have that argument later. But, <laughs> That's for Thursday's first topic. <laughs> and Matt, what would be your two desert island recordings? I think I'm, I'm with Larry in that it, it's kind of changing all the time. So I can just, I always say when I'm asked this, like what I'm into right now. So what it is right now that I'd have to have. There's this recording from Steve Reich's collected works of New York Counterpoint that is just amazing. It's the, the it's, I, I can't believe the feel that's inside this thing and how interesting these layers can be in the pre-recorded thing. And then probably the, the Bang on a Can uh, Greatest Hits album. So I just love all the Bang on a Can composers. If anyone doesn't know that, this this greatest hits album has always been "Cheating, Lying, Stealing" by David Lang. Just that's that's one of my favorites. Fantastic, and um, Jeff. First choice would almost definitely be Radiohead in Rainbows, and second choice I was debating. I'm, I'm going to cop out and say two, but either uh, Bon Iver's I, I or Sue Found Stevens' uh, Carrie and Lowell. Those are wonderful options. Those are fantastic. I think um, I'm on a jazz kick right now, so I would have to have Akhman Jamal Live at the Persian, and I would need Bill Evans complete at the Village Vanguard, just because he is... That is phenomenal. Yeah, do, do, you, know, do you know the conversations with myself? No. It's recorded on Glenn Gould at Steinway D. They, they were friends. No it's, way. Yeah, it's a crazy story. Bill Evans and, St and Glenn Gould were friends. And um, he went over to his apartment and recorded this album where he recorded, he laid down one track and then overdubbed it himself. So that's why it's conversations with myself. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's two piano. It's two piano, four hand, one guy. Okay, so now I know what I'll listen to this afternoon. Um, and of course, Jenya mentioned um, art song, and I think that I, I can't pick which Schunemüllerin I would need to have with me. But if I'm on a desert island and I have no hope, I'm Wunderlich. Gonna... Yeah. Wunderlich. Yeah, I was thinking that. He's just kind of exquisite. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, our guests online, our guests listening, this has been such a fun time. Um, I can't wait to meet these people in person for a concert one day. Um, it's been great to meet Yevgeny, who I've you've been co corresponding with on the internet for a few years and um, trying to work out concerts, but things have just been crazy. Uh, good to see my friend Larry again, and great to meet new percussionist friends, um, Matt and Jeff. So thank you everybody for being here. Um, we'll get the guys to stay on the call just a sec after I unclick record. But this has been another episode of Take Note. Thank you everybody for joining us.